Hello. Hello. Hi. Welcome. Um, I'm going to turn down my sick beats. Um, so, uh, welcome. I have news for everyone. Uh, it's still spring. Ha ha. Yeah. This is definitely like the time of weather, the time of year where I just want to kind of curl up and forget about Wisconsin. I just said that out loud, but it's true. Well, we did have a really great weekend, though, so there's, there's that. Um, today, we're going to jump into coding, and uh, I'm going to just kind of move through uh, this stuff um, as you know, efficiently as I can. Um, today, we're going to be dealing with almost all of the boring stuff, um, so brace yourselves. We're going to talk about syntax and comments and um, stuff that's really, really, really important, but uh, it might not result in cool looking stuff. Um, so yeah, let's go ahead and jump into that and also sort of do the end of semester uh, orientation. So as I said today, we're going to get into p5.js. I know we had a little sample uh, last Wednesday. Um, this is a section of the course where the lecture slides will be extremely useful to you in a way that the previous lecture slides have been perhaps more informative. Um, so what do I mean by that? I mean, the uh, lecture slides have pseudocode that you could potentially like cut and paste into the editor and stuff like that. And they, Basically, I'm going to roll through the key points that are in the slides every class period from here on out. Um, but if you're sort of like thinking, oh, what was that thing that she did? How does it work? Why did I do it? There's a sort of detailed information laid out on the lecture slides. Um, so they should be quite educational, I hope. So. Um, I'm going to actually keep those up. I don't know why I did that. And uh, I'm also going to be going over some of this other stuff. Um, one thing that I do try to do during the code section of the course is I try to take whatever code that I worked on in class, and I like to post a link to it. Um, so that that way, if you wanted to look at it again and not have to look at it on a video screen, if you wanted to use it maybe as a starting point for one of your projects, um, you could certainly do that. So just take a, keep an, a lookout for that link as well. Um, tomorrow, we're basically going to do more of uh, kind of what we are doing today. However, uh, tomorrow I'm going to add in the sort of added wonderfulness of uh, debugging with chat GPT. So if you don't already have a chat GPT account, um, you might want to click on the link and just sign up for an account. It's super easy. You can click through with your Google account or whatever you prefer to do in those kinds of situations. Um, but yeah, uh, basically tomorrow uh, on, on Wednesday, um, I am going to spend a significant portion of class talking about how to use ChatGPT as a debugging tool. Now, uh, you can also use ChatGPT as a code authoring tool. Um, I would particularly recommend this if you're looking for D plus uh, creative coding assignments. Um, what do I mean by that? It's not that good. Um, so I can't say that I would recommend it. I generated a bunch of solutions to our assignments with ChatGPT, and I would definitely, maybe not even D plus, maybe D minus. Um, like, yeah, they just barely do what you tell it to do. Um, Unless maybe you wanted to do something really specific, like something like draw a grid with you know, these very specific shapes. Um, but if you ask it to draw like a cat barfing rainbows, it mm, doesn't, doesn't work so well. Even just the cat, I asked it to draw a pixelated cat, and it was like, like one ear up, one ear down. It was kind of cute in like a really sad way, but not in any way what I asked for. Um, so we'll talk about that more uh, on Wednesday, but in general, um, I'm sort of not super concerned about people using um, AI technology. I have this like really shocking position on it. It's a tool. We use tools in this class. 
many of them. <laughs> um, and AI is just another tool. So uh, mostly we're going to be talking about sort of like when it's good to use it or, you know, what it's useful for and what it's not useful for right now. Um, so then going into next week, we're going to do full-time coding next week. And then we have uh, uh, a third week, uh, which is the first week in May. Um, during the third week in May, uh, I will, uh, obviously on that last class day, I will be doing a final exam review. And then uh, that is, let's see, Wednesday, May 3rd. And then I will definitely be putting the final exam review on video because our final exam is not until May 11th. Um, so it's at the very la end of the review period. Um, I don't know if you have feelings about that. Eh, whatever. It's fine. It's just kind of weird to have that gap between the last day of class and when you take the final. Um, does anyone have any questions about class stuff or even uh, maybe P5 stuff? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, okay. All right, awesome. So um, I'm gonna sort of come into these lecture slides. And today we're gonna be talking about like the most basic of the basic. Um, so if you already um, probably have some exposure to a co uh, any kind of code platform or programming language, this might be kind of boring um, and kind of probably repetitive, but um, I do think that this stuff is really uh, important. And from programming language to programming language, hang on, let me get my thing off. Um, from programming language to programming language, uh, there are lots of differences in some of these uh, habit, habits, whether, um, whether a programming language uh, accepts white space, for example. Um, or whether it ignores white space. Um, so even if you know how to program, it could also be useful to just find out what the specificities of p5.js are. So we're going to be talking today about the basic rules of p5.js. Um, we're also going to be talking about statements and what order they're executed in. And then we're also going to talk about uh, p5.js at drawing basic shapes and how it handles drawing shapes to the screen. So um, one of the things that you might be asking yourself is, uh, this is our code from last class, what, uh, what is P5? P5.js um, is a library that has been written for JavaScript. So it is a subset of the JavaScript language and it allows you to create visual art and interactive um, objects in uh, a way that would be much more direct uh, rather than using um, JavaScript as JavaScript. Um, so yeah, that's basically what it is. It's based on a language called processing that was written in um, uh, probably in the early 2000s at MIT and they've been kind of spreading it around the country ever since then. Um, processing is the major sort of art uh, programming language right now, I think, um, and p5.js is the, it's sort of internet enabled sister or brother, um, and uh, p5.js is mostly used to create really fancy websites or objects that get embedded in websites. Um, so that being said, let's talk a little bit about the structure. So. Um, there are statements and there are functions right now in our code. Um, actually, I think before I go much further, I'm going to make my stuff a little larger here. Okay. So um, this, this create, uh, line, create canvas, and we'll be kind of dump, getting into this more deeply. This is called a statement. And um, we know that it's a statement because it has this uh, semicolon at the end. And if you care about color coding, color coding is actually one of the number one ways to avoid errors while you're coding. 
So um, if it's color coded in blue, that means that it's a function. And uh, then we have these sort of, this parentheses are for parameters, and then we've got parameters. Don't worry, we'll go over all this again. Um, so what would happen, let's say, if I wanted to get rid of one of these statements temporarily? So if I play, play this, if you hit the play button, that will cause your code to compile. I use air quotes there because it's not really a compiled language. It just gives you the sort of, it's like, um, I don't know, it's like one of those air fresheners you hang in your car, like it's not pine, but it smells like pine. Yeah, it's, it's an imitation of a compiler, um, technically. So in any case, it allows you to interact with the sort of sketch window. And if we wanted to get rid of one of these things, we could use the double, double slash. And so that is called a comment. Um, comments can be really vital in coding. And personally, if I had one thing, I've you know, developed quite a few apps and interactive artworks over the years. If I had one thing that I wished I would have done better um, with all of that code, I wish that I would have commented it more. Um, and a lot of times when you're coding, maybe you're cocky, uh, like me, and you're like, oh, I know what that means. I don't need to comment it. Well, just, just wait three or four years and come back to it um, and see what you think then. <laughs> um, in other words, um, just because you understand it now and you don't need a comment doesn't mean that you don't need a comment later to kind of explain to you how it, was, how it, how it works. Um, so that's exactly what this comment over here is for. It's basically just a comment to remind myself how ellipse uh, works. And in this case, I just wrote down that it's x, y, which are coordinates, and then width and height. And that's what these numbers correspond to. So that's, you know, comments are super vital, and they're definitely um, something that you should uh, consider using, um, especially, I would say, if you're new to coding. Um, you can also, I know that this, co um, this comment was written sort of in pseudocode, um, but uh, you can also uh, write comments that are in sort of plain English. Um, and that's totally fine. Um, or whatever language you feel comfortable speaking, um, that would be cool if I could code comments in Dwarven. That would be a new, a new level. Um, and so getting back to statements, we have uh, sort of several statements in our sketch, but we could add a couple more. Um, these two things right here are definitely statements. And Maybe let's make another couple of uh, statements just so we have a few to kind of play with. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, add another couple ellipses. And <laughs> um, so the, I just cut and paste these and these are exactly the same as they were before. Um, maybe here I'll say something like mouse Y minus 10 and then here I'll say mouse y minus, I don't know, 20. And uh, now I can compile that and you can see that I have three of those ellipses that are just slightly, at slightly different coordinates, right? Um, so that's definitely something to think about. I could also maybe recode some of this um, width and height stuff. So maybe I'll have them be graduated so here I'll go 200 and 300. And then I actually feel like I need to have these be much further apart, so I'm gonna add a zero there. And then we get something like that. Um, what we're doing sort of right now is not really that important, but what I, I wanna point out a couple of things to you. Um, I wanna point out the fact that this um, mouse Y minus 100 if I were in like, I don't know, middle school in my math class, which I hated by the way, um, I probably would have been encouraged to do that. Uh, that's fine, there's nothing wrong with that. You can put uh, parentheses inside of arguments as much as you want. 
And certainly, if it were something like mouse y minus 100 plus 100, which is just mouse y, by the way, um, th then we would need that first set of parentheses, right? Because otherwise, it doesn't really understand uh, order of operations. Um, you may see in the reference that it does understand order of operations, and I guess I can absolutely guarantee you that it does not. Um, so I'm telling you right now, when in doubt, use parentheses. <laughs> um, so anyway, um, those are just some other kind of things to think about. And then uh, another thing that we could think about with these three uh, statements is uh, that they do have semicolons right now. So it's possible to do delete this one or more semicolons or do your entire sketch without semicolons. It's possible. Is it a good idea? Probably not, and I'll tell you why. Because if you move that sketch into other development environments or if you move it onto, say, a web server or something like that, your sketch will break hard. Um, will your sketch break? if you don't use per, the sort of semicolon at the end of a statement in general. I've, I've seen a lot of people have broken sketches and uh, semicolon, semicolon inclusion is usually one of the culprits. So I think it's a kind of risky thing to do if you feel super confident, like you're an elite hacker, I say in jest. Um, then uh, you definitely would not uh, take your chances. But if you're just learning to code for the first time, I would strongly advise you to use semicolons at the end of your statements. Um, okay, so the other thing that I wanted to show you relative to these three things is that uh, P5 is um, a white space ignoring language. What does that mean? Well, basically, it means that you can put a ton of white space between things that are supposed to go together, and this will still run. It's giving you uh, a, a, a warning, um, but it is still running and working, right? Um, do you, is it good practice to set up a statement like this? I am gonna say categorically it is not good practice. Um, and why is it not good practice? Um, well, when you're coding, uh, you need your code to be human readable. And when you start adding white space in weird places, that makes it not very human readable. Um, so I would definitely uh, advise you not to use strange strangely large amounts of white space. Now, there is a place where you can use white space, and that is in between stuff. So let's say we wanted to separate these ellipses from the background. Sure, go for it. Stick in as much white space as you would like. This type of white space can be really helpful in organizing sections of your code um, and kind of letting you know, okay, if it's got some white space, there's a break there, then what comes next is the next thing, for example. Um, so yeah, white space is not bad, it just needs to be kind of used properly. Um, the other thing that you can use white space for is for indentation, and um, indentation can just be a way for you to, I use the tab uh, key, by the way, indentation can be a way for you to kind of create a hierarchy so that you can recognize the the way that code nests together. And we'll get into indentation when we get into more complex code. I'm a humongous fan of indentation because I think that it really helps you understand how the code is working and how certain parts of the code relate to other parts of the code because they're sort of at the same level. So, but like I said, we'll get to that when we kind of get there. So, Let's talk about functions really succinctly. So we already have a couple of functions in our sketch. So right now we have the create canvas function, we have the background function, the ellipse function, 
And then we also have, by the way, the draw function and the setup function. Now, setup and draw are the only two uh, things that you have when you create a processing sketch. So if I create a sketch from scratch, let me real quickly, no, not you. Um, if I create this new sketch, and I just wanted to copy what I had before, <laughs> you can see when you create a brand new sketch, what it creates is it creates a setup function and a draw function. And then inside of setup and draw, you can call other functions. So if I were you and I had never seen P5 before, I would probably be asking myself right now, well, how do I know what functions I can use? That's an awesome question. Um, I will tell you that there are gonna be quite a few functions that you're gonna get exposed to through our demos, but if you go up to help and you go to the reference, um, what you see here is every single function that you can use in P5. And so some of this is like really, uh, you know, obscure math stuff, um, weird 3D rendering stuff, um, data structures. You'll also see, um, let's see. Uh, So there's a section here called 2D primitives, and these are all the shapes that you can uh, call. So let's go ahead and try maybe something like this line thing. And if I go to the page for the line, um, you can see it gives me a couple of examples on how to use it. And then down here, it gives me the so-called syntax. And this is that pseudocode that I was telling you about. Um, that we made for the, for the ellipse. Um, and so this is really just a way of telling you how many parameters you have, how many items you have between commas, and sort of what they're for. So if we go back to uh, line, you can see here x1, y1, x2, y2. Well, I guess if you got an A in algebra, that might actually sound kind of familiar to you, but if it, it doesn't, X1 is the X coordinate of the first point, has an X and a Y, and the second point has an X and a Y. So that's what X and Y. And then you see that they have this other version down here, and this other version uh, calls for a Z. Well, that's the 3D line. And so if you only want a 2D line, only use X and Y, and if you want it to be 3D, you add that extra parameter um, for a total of six parameters here. Okay, let's go ahead and try this out. So if I draw, let's see, line at, uh, let's start at zero, zero. That seems like a pretty good place to start, right? And then we end, let's say we end at mouse X, mouse Y. Then it sort of magnetizes the line to the cursor. Weep. So, you might also um, be thinking about this as you're looking at this, and you might be thinking, hmm, I wonder what that background is for. Well, let's try getting rid of it and see what happens. So I just commented it out with a double slash. And when the background is not on, um, it basically saves the data from every frame that you draw. Um, so this is a really good sort of way to kind of start to get your head around uh, frame rate and frames. Um, so we could definitely bring the background back. I'm not gonna get too deep into like all the fancy things that you can do, um, just because I wanna make sure that we cover some of these very, very basic things. So the background uh, function is also kind of uh, somewhat special. So you noticed in the line there were two possible ways of um, 
using the arguments and the, the parameters for coordinates, right? There was one that was x1, y1, y, x2, y2. Um, and then there was a second one. The background function actually has uh, a whole lot of different ways that you can deal with it. So the way the background function works, um, it works in all of these different ways. And so if you pass it just one color, um, it should uh, function as a single color. You can also uh, pass it a grayscale value right here, and then it has this sort of optional extra parameter, that's what these brackets are for, an optional parameter for alpha. So um, what does that mean? That means that if you type any number in there, that will be interpreted as the transparency value of the background. So I think, and then you can also do RGB um, if you're in RGB color. So uh, that's what this one is for. And lastly, you can set an image. So I think I'm gonna go for this grayscale with an alpha thing. And I have the grayscale right now, so I think I'm gonna go with an alpha. And I think I'm actually gonna draw the background after we draw all the other stuff. So what's happening basically is that we're drawing the background on top of what we just drew and it's drawing um, with an alpha value, so it's transparent. Okay? So just a thing you can do. Um, in general, unless I'm trying to be super fancy, I usually put the background at the top of the draw function. Um, let me see what else we have in here. That's good, yep. Ah, another super important thing, um, and that is that um, we, in our code, um, we may want to use uh, capital letters. So for example, we may want to say something like this. Um, is that gonna help us at all? No. Um, P5 and JavaScript in general are extremely case sensitive. So it is really important that you mind uh, whether something's uppercase or lowercase. Um, it's also super common um, to, to do things in what's called camel case. Um, this is where it has a uppercase hump. Um, and so it's just the kind of thing that you have to notice. You have to be sort of detail oriented to um, do this successfully. So yeah, be on the lookout for <clears throat> case sensitivity. And then let's see. Let's talk about structure a little bit. So we kind of started talking about structure a tiny bit. In other words, we have the setup function and then we have a draw function. So, <clears throat> pardon me. Um, so what does that even mean, uh, setup and draw? Well, I'll give you a, a hint. So draw um, does exactly what it says it does. It draws to the window. Um, so we've got this window over here and the draw function, pretty much all it does, it can do lots of other stuff, but what it's really for is for drawing to the, to the window. So whatever we have in here um, is, gonna, is gonna appear in the window. Um, setup is something that I would recommend that folks use. Uh, you need to use it with every sketch because it does important things, like it creates the window. That's what Create Canvas is for. And you can also do all sorts of other setup things, like color mode. So here, let's do RGB 100. And that'll sort of make sense later. Um, but for now, we're just sort of creating the color mode. So setup um, runs once and only once when you start the sketch.
So that's incidentally why it's called setup, because it literally like does a bunch of like housekeeping stuff that you might need to put in the draw function. So this runs once at the start. The draw function draws to the window, that's true. Um, it draws to the window at the frame rate. So if I were to come in here to set up and declare a frame rate, um, let's go for 30 to start with. Um, this is probably pretty close to what our frame rate should be at anyway. So you can see here it's running fairly quickly. It's refreshing fairly quickly. If I raise the frame rate up even more, maybe to 60, which by the way is the maximum frame rate that your web browser will support, you can see it's a little bit snippier. And if I lower the frame rate, let's lower it way down to something like five, you're really gonna notice a difference here. It's like, oh, I'm in web 1.0, hello. Um, which, you know, there are reasons why you would need to use an extremely low frame rate sometimes. Um, it just kind of depends on what you're looking for out of your animation. If you're looking for a sort of general purpose frame rate that will not, should not kill your computer, try 30. That's sort of the standard frame rate for video, so it's a good, it's a good general purpose frame rate. Um, so here's another way to tell how our frame rate. So within the draw function, which is again drawing, you know, at 30 frames per second now, um, we could use the print function. And the print function is really just a way of saying hello. And you have this console down here, and there are all kinds of reasons why you might need to print something out in that console. Usually, I don't print out hello to myself because I'm not quite that lonely. Um, but usually I use the console for printing like the value of something as it's changing so that I can see if the number's going up or the number's going down, that, that sort of thing. Or I'll print out my own sort of custom error messages to the console. Like, I did a thing. It's pretty useful, right? Pretty useful to know. So um, we'll come back to using the console, but it's, it's down here and it's one of your most useful tools actually for debugging and um, you know, coding in general. <clears throat> so that's pretty much the setup and draw in a nutshell. Um, there is a, a sort of additional sort of section that we can think about and that is the top above here is a place where I like to put what are called global variables. Um, so here's a, a great global variable. I'll call it blah. So I'm gonna let blah equal zero. And then down here, I'm gonna print the value of blah um, to the console. We'll see what that looks like. Hey, it looks like zero, that's good news. And now you don't sort of like get into this until maybe we do something like this, which is blah plus plus, that's a shortcut, we'll get into these later. That's basically blah equals blah plus one. And so now you can see that blah is just um, iterating or incrementing off into infinity. And when you write code like this, which is inside of a draw function that's looping 30 frames a second, um, and you add one to blah with every frame, um, I guess theoretically if you let, let this run long enough, it would crap out on you and you know, you'd have to do something else. Usually I write code that prevents that from happening, which we'll talk about real soon, yeah. So it'll just keep going forever. 
Um, there is such a thing as a never-ending for loop. Um, we'll get into that later, um, but that's a really good way to sort of like uh, potentially uh, cause you to have to do a hard restart on your computer. <laughs> um, anyway, there's no risk here. It's just sort of, um, you know, it's just not sort of, it's not the best conceived uh, thing. So I'm gonna get rid of this for now. Um, I'm a huge fan of getting rid of things that I'm not using, and that just goes back to like organization. Um, keeping your code organized is probably one of the toughest challenges, um, and it's definitely one of the things that can help you actually be a much better coder. So let's see. We talked a little bit about that. We talked about coordinates. So yes, um, coordinates are pretty much the juice that P5 runs on, meaning that there's this Cartesian coordinate plane. Um, if you remember anything about algebra or trigonometry in high school, yeah, it's that, sorry. Um, but that's how coordinates are specified. Um, if you're a math major and you're thinking about um, maybe using some other uh, coordinate system, P5 does actually support polar coordinates, but if you're not a math nerd, I would not recommend that. So um, yeah, coordinates are super important. Um, you can uh, you know, use the coordinates um, in a really sort of simple way, like here we're drawing, starting at zero, zero, and then the second point is at the mouse, um, but we could also sort of constrain this to maybe something like 100, and you can see now it's sort of limited. The Y coordinate of that second point is now capped out at 100, right? So thinking about using coordinates um, is definitely a necessity. Um, I wanna talk to you just for a second about stacking order. So stacking order is something that processing just does. Uh, P5 just does a sort of natively. Um, you might be thinking about, well, how does, how does this know, this line know that it's on top of the circles? Mm, that's a good question. It's on top of the circles because the order in which these lines are executed is the order in which they're read, which is top to bottom, always. Unless you tell it not to do that. That's a different thing. But for the most part, code goes from top to bottom. It gets read from top to bottom. So, so if we put these in the opposite order, if we wanted to put the big uh, ellipse in the back, we would just have to put these in the opposite order. So I would basically kind of get this through here and get this through here. And now we should be ready, except I left a copy of this down here. Um, also, you may find yourself, there we go, so now it's in the back. You may find yourself um, getting a little bit frustrated with code, um, especially with making syntax errors, which are basically like a fancy word for misspellings. If that happens to you a lot, cut and paste stuff. Um, I cut and paste like 90% of my code from my own code that already works. Um, or you could cut and paste it out of the reference manual. Um, when you do that, you just eliminate that possibility that you're gonna type something wrong. And I don't know about you all, but I am like a criminally terrible typist. Um, so it's, it, there's no shame in cutting and pasting. All right, so let's see what else we have in here. So we're gonna do something fun uh, before we leave. Um, and next time we're gonna start looking at math expressions and conditionals. So this is sort of like what I would call the meat and potatoes of programming. Um, because right now, we're really only able, if we stick to what we've learned today, we're really only able to kind of draw shapes to the screen at a specific location, right? Um, 
And when you're making a sort of interactive thing, uh, you might actually want to have quite a bit more complexity. Um, and so in the next two days, we're going to be sort of like thinking about how to take these basic building blocks and to kind of like, you know, blow it open. So I'm going to go ahead and do this one at mouse Y. Um, let's see, and I made a variable up here called blah. So I think it might be kind of nice to do something with that variable. So let me double check what's happening here. Okay, looks like my frame rate is still super, okay, sometimes if your computer is busy because we're working on a web browser, the frame rate might vary a little, um, and I think that that's probably what's happening right now. It looks like it's better now. Um, in other words, this is not gonna be like playing Halo in your, in your, in your room. Um, it's, uh, it's not quite that performance oriented. So um, yeah, let's play around with this variable. So it's called blah, and maybe I'll make this mouse x coordinate uh, blah. And so basically that's zero, right? And how about before we draw from blah, we change the value of blah? So I'm gonna make blah equal to mouse x. And hopefully that's like a really clear example of how now um, blah is getting the value of mouse x, and then we're just using the value of blah. Now, you might be asking yourself, why don't we just use mouse x? Well, mostly because I wanted to show you how blah works. Um, but yeah, it's exactly the same. Um, it's just a different way of doing it. Now, what probably would be good here is we could maybe do something like mouse x divided by 100, um, and maybe that's something where we don't wanna like type an expression in there or some, something like that. Um, Probably, I would say maybe divided by 10. That looks like it's not quite doing what it's doing. Yeah. And so now we have this like itty bitty little X range, right? Um, so the point is that you can uh, create a container, which is the let uh, syntax here. And then you can put stuff in that container, right? That's assign, this is the, called the assignment operator. Most normal people call it the equal sign. Um, and then you can use that container to do all sorts of different things. That's, in a nutshell, that's what a variable is. So I think we could probably also um, get back to what else? I think that's probably enough for today. I don't know about you, but I have a slight case of the blahs, um, and uh, I could use the extra five minutes to grab a cup of coffee. Um, so we're gonna, there's so much more coding ahead. Um, we have barely scratched the surface. Um, and yeah, I'm excited to work with y'all on it. Okay, bye. Bye, have a great weekend. No, have a great mm, couple of days.